And what's going on, everyone? Thanks for tuning back into the channel. My name is Zach Davis. Appreciate you being with me today. Today, I want to start uh, a couple ideas and give some thoughts on one problem that people have with the idea of preterism. And it is the idea that sin goes on forever, that there's never an end to sin, that it's just one perpetual, continual thing after another. Uh, so before we get into that, don't forget to like and subscribe down below. And if you want to support us, follow us on patreon.com slash Zach Davis or become a member here on YouTube. All right. No more sin. I hear this one all the time. People say, Zach, I just have a hard time with it. I see some of the points that you're making exegetically. Uh, we see some of the points like heaven and earth referring uh, to the idea of the old covenant system in Second Peter 3. We see that the burning up of heaven and earth revolves around that. But we really have a problem with the fact that people just sin forever and ever and ever. And I think this is where you get into the idea of what the Bible is trying to convey to us. I don't think the Bible is trying to give us a complete history uh, from beginning to the end. I don't think that's the idea in the text at all. I think the Bible is concerned with man's covenant relationship to God. One thing I want to point out to everybody is there's a, there's a spot in the Bible, specifically Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, and there are others, but let's focus on Daniel 9, 24 today. Daniel 9, 24 says that 70 weeks are determined for your people in your holy city. And Daniel's people are, are the Jews, and his holy city is Jerusalem. And I take the terminus of this to be AD 70 at the destruction of Jerusalem that Daniel was predicted would be rebuilt, and then it would be destroyed and bring an end to that covenant system. So there's something unique that's bound up and tied in that. And if you're post-millennial, and one thing I want to point out here is a lot of post-millennials will end Daniel 70 weeks, three and a half years after Jesus raises from the dead, or some of them may try to end it in 80, 70 around that time. But either way, if you're post-millennial, Daniel 70 weeks are over. And I have never heard a post-millennial address this passage in Daniel 9, 24, specifically the part that says to bring it into sin. So if we just stop at a very face level, this is not simply a full preterism question that has to be answered. If you're post-millennial, or even if you're some all-millennial that's ended the 70 weeks, um, I've even heard people like maybe even Michael Brown takes in a premillennial stance the 70 weeks that were over. Uh, double check me on that, but I feel like I've, I've heard him discuss that idea somewhere or not. I could be wrong on that, but uh, if you know, leave that down in the comments. But this is, this is a question that everyone has to answer if you've ended the 70 weeks already. That's, there has been an end to sin. And this is when we get into the idea of what the Bible is trying to accomplish when it brings an end to sin. I don't think the Bible is trying to get us to a time period on this earth where nobody ever does wrong to God. What I think was trying to be accomplished and what I believe the scriptures uh, are attempting to accomplish and the redemptive work of Christ is accomplishing and what I believe is that the eschaton is connected to the fullness of the redemptive plan. What I think the Bible is trying to accomplish when it brings an end to sin in 8070, connected to Daniel 924, is that the covenant status between man and God, that his legal standing has been fully brought to pass, thus bringing an end to sin, transgression of God's requirements. Now, just because we say this idea, this doesn't mean that people don't wrong God who are now in the new covenant. So if, if my sin is no longer counted against me, and I think the reform crowd has a proper understanding of this, and much of that reform crowd is going to be in your post-millennial world, the reform crowd has an understanding that my sin is no longer imputed to me. And when we say that there's no more sin, that's the idea that I think if the post-millennial world was consistent, they would have to go to. But that's the way that I understand that, that the fullness of sin because of the fullness of the redemptive plan is no longer imputed to man, that God has brought that to pass, fulfilling all the requirements, and we've been accredited his righteousness. Now you say, Zach, how come you don't think that happens before AD 70? Well, I would place it in an already not yet that were they righteous? Yes. Were they justified? Yes. Were they waiting on these things? Yes, Galatians 5.5 5 says that they were eagerly waiting uh, through the Spirit uh, for righteousness. Why were they eagerly waiting righteousness? Because they didn't have the fullness yet. You and I have that 2,000 years later, post eighty seventy, because that's when the redemptive work is completed. So for those of us who now trust in Christ, sin is not imputed to our account anymore in the fullest sense. Do I think they were saved? Yes. Do I think even the people in, under the old 
covenant? Do I think that they were, um, do I think that they were in a standing that was a hundred percent full? No, I think that's why they died and went to Hades or Sheol. When we think about the idea of no more sin, understand, friend, that we're not saying that nobody wrongs God today. Okay, I think there are plenty of people that wrong God. Even uh, me as a pastor, even as um, you know, as Christians, that we do wrong God. But the idea is about our covenantal and positional standing. We're not talking about practice. We're talking about position. So when people get the understanding and the idea of well, no more sin. You got to understand when that's connected to and what that's tied to, because you're going to run out of verses in the New Testament, exactly like I did, of saying, well, there's going to be a day when there's absolutely nobody wrongs God here on the earth. There's not a New Testament verse that teaches that. And consequently, there's not an Old Testament verse that teaches that. That's not what the Bible is trying to accomplish. What the Bible is trying to accomplish is that even though um, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that those who trust in Christ, that that sin is not counted against them. This is the reformed doctrine of, of the imputed righteousness of Christ. This is the uh, that's the entire idea behind what we're teaching in that. So the hang up comes when people say, all right, if the world goes on forever, then people are just going to go and continually wrong God forever. Number one, I would say not every full preterist thinks that the world is going to go on forever. If you ask me that, I would say I simply don't know. I don't think the Bible is addressing that. I don't think that's the concern of the text. I don't think um, the Bible anywhere is talking about whether or not the world's going to go on forever. I would strictly chalk that up to I don't know and the Bible doesn't speak about it. However, if you turned it around and said the world does go on forever, Zach, I have a problem with uh, the idea that people are going to wrong God forever and ever. And I would say, friend, that's not what the Bible's trying to accomplish. So for that to be a hang up for you with something that the Bible's not addressing, is really not a fair biblical argument in case to be made because the Bible nowhere is trying to get us to a state where no one ever wrongs God again. What the Bible was trying to do and did fully bring to pass was to get us to the new heavens and new earth, 2 Peter 3, where righteousness dwells. And that's the standing of those who were credited righteousness uh, in the fullness of the covenant. Now, that was the intent of the text, and that's what God brought to pass. So I can't be looking for something in the future that the Bible doesn't speak about and doesn't concern itself with. Furthermore, if you wanted to take it technically, if you want to go back to the garden or even back to take the Old Testament or take the Gentiles who had never heard of God, Romans chapter 5, I believe, tells us, and even if you want to take the idea of the Old Testament and some of those people who were outside of Israel, that the people who were outside of the covenant had sinned. That they didn't have the knowledge, though, to shed light on it. They weren't given the knowledge of the law to shed light on the fact that they were in sin. And you might even take this case with Adam in the garden. Friends, if you've never thought about this, Adam was not born in the garden. Meaning, God, Adam was outside of the garden. God brought Adam into covenant with him and shed light on the fact. And that's how he uh, recognized that he was a sinner. You can make the case that Adam wronged God outside of the garden. But the problem came when he brought him into covenant. And then he broke the law of God and transgressed and because the light was shed on it. That was the idea, and that's the separation for breaking the covenant. That doesn't even necessarily mean that Adam didn't wrong God or outside uh, when he was outside the covenant. The problem for Israel, and I would say the same for Adam, is that they were in the covenant and they kept breaking the covenant. Why? Because no one could uh, become righteous by their own works. No one could become righteous by keeping the law. Thus the need for Christ Jesus, who now can keep all men in the covenant, that there's no spiritual separation, i.e. no more death. No one is separated from God in Christ Jesus. Uh, no one can stand to accuse because we have been imputed the righteousness of Christ and he has uh, declared our legal standing as justified righteous and that can never be changed. And the point of the text is to get us into a better covenant, according to Hebrews, which is a better covenant to how we relate to God, the way John 14, 6 is through Jesus Christ, that we can come back into the presence of God, into the presence of the Father, into the Holy of Holies, and we can stay there and remain there uh, because our sin is not accredited or imputed to our account anymore. It's been taken by Christ, and there's not the idea that um, our positional standing can be changed. So when we talk about the idea, and if that's a hang-up for you that um, – Sin's going to go on forever and ever. Friends, I would simply say you don't have a text that's telling you that there's going to be a day where sin, if, if, 
if you think there is one, will you please put it in the comments below and I'll try to address it and I'll try to come up with something. And if I whiff this, then I'll repent and apologize. But if you think there's a text in the New Testament that you can show that says there's coming a day where there's not going to be anyone on the earth who wrongs God, then um, I would like for you to put it in the comments below. I know somebody's going to comment Revelation 21 or Revelation 22, and as soon as you do that, I'm going to take you back to covenantal terms, to how the Old Testament and how the New Testament are using the phrases heaven and earth and how those things that are in there are covenantal. And I'm also, if you say, Zach, there's no more death in the new heaven and earth, I'm going to tag my video uh, that I did not too long ago about the death that Jesus was defeating. So some of these things have already been addressed. Don't be mad at me if I comment a video, if I've already addressed it. That's the point of why I make these videos. So when someone asks me a question, I can just send them a link and don't have to spend 30 minutes to an hour every time somebody asks me a question. So uh, let me know what you think down below, guys. And maybe I'll try to do some more of these hangups uh, specifically in regards to full preterism. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you soon.